Today, in the Christian calendar, this is a day known as Reformation Sunday. It was in, I believe, 1517, supposed to be in on October the 31st, that Martin Luther posted his 95 Thesis to the Wittenberg Chapel. And uh, that's the, today, Sunday is uh, the closest to that date. And it was a protest, therefore the name Protestant came about, uh, protesting the, some of the abuses of the Catholic Church. And even many of our Catholic friends will look back and say, yes, there needed to be reform. There, there was some things going on that shouldn't have been going on. And even though, uh, you know, we as United Methodists, uh, not everyone in here is United Methodist, but as a United Beth Methodist group, we aren't technically Protestant. I don't know if you realize that. Uh, but rather than coming from uh, the Reformed Church, the, the Reformation, uh, the United Methodists came from the Church of England, really, with John Wesley uh, coming over here and and beginning a movement. Uh, part of the reason the Church of England started uh, was not really didn't have anything to do with those reasons that Luther uh, in Europe was protesting. It really had to do with basically a king who uh, wanted to divorce his wife, and because the Pope had some pretty stringent rules on that, he started his own church. That's how we got the Church of England, basically. And uh, it was, the, in a sense, the Catholic Church of England. But uh, when Wesley came here and tried to uh, ordain people and was not given that opportunity or that right, no one to do that, hence the Methodist Church started from that. But we can look at the Protestant movement today and see <clears throat> some things that happen and, and why they happen. Now, I think what happened was, is which happens a lot of times, that the pendulum swings too far. And so some of the things that were good about the former church and the Catholic church, in order to do away with any uh, recognition of the Catholic Church, they did away with a lot of things that I think were good traditions. Uh, but having said that, we understand the reason behind the Protestant Reformation. Basically, I think Martin Luther was trying to call the church back to the basics, back to the Bible, back to Jesus. Somehow, they had lost sight of that, much like we may have today, this need to get back to the basics. And I think that is a good segue into what we're talking about today. Because the Bible says that a certain lawyer came to Christ. And I'm going to spare you lawyer jokes today. Uh, but basically understand that th this wasn't a lawyer as we think of it. A lawyer is someone who's an expert in law. And he was. But he was an expert in the law of Moses, the, the biblical laws. And they had been trying to test Jesus. And I think Matthew... And Luke both say that he was trying to test Jesus. But Mark has a little different slant. Mark basically uh, sounds like he, this guy really does want to know an answer. He's really uh, seriously trying to find out. But at any rate, uh, he asked Jesus a question, which of the commandments are the greatest commandments? And when we think of commandments, we usually think of the Ten Commandments. But actually, he was referring to... Uh, all of the commandments, and the Jews had, and the scribes, the, the religious experts, had counted all the laws and precepts of Moses in the Old Testament, and they had come up with 613. 613 rules, really, that you had to follow. And so what he is really asking is, of these 613 laws and rules, which are the most weightier? Which are the most important? And this was something that they, they would argue about oftentimes in their dialogue and debate 
Uh, you know, if you think about thou shalt not murder and all these things, these were some that were, they would consider more weightier, that, that holds more weight, more important. You know, it's like, uh, it's like the, the meal with hot sauce. You know, it's just a big deal. It's got to have that. Uh, but uh, the others, uh, well, yeah, not so big a deal. So which of these 613 laws are the most important? And Jesus, out of the 613, picks two. And he basically says, if you can take these two laws, you can pretty much hang all the others up and live by these two, and these two, and you'll do good. You'll be close to God. These two, which which are, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Only two. Well, that's a lot easier, isn't it, uh, than 613? It sounds easy, anyway. But in this situation, Jesus tells this man, he's like, oh, okay. I get it. Well, I, I've been doing these things and all that. And, and, and Jesus tells him, you're, you're almost there. You're close to the kingdom of God. You're not far from the kingdom. Oh, how we would love to hear those words. That we aren't far from the kingdom. We're, we're, we're almost there. And, in other words, the question that he's really asking, I think, is how can I really live how can I be perfect? Wait a minute. Perfect? Nobody's perfect, right? Well, Jesus uh, one time even said, Be ye therefore perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. You know, so was he just saying that and didn't mean it? Was he, did he have his holy fingers crossed when he said it, that we are to be perfect? Even John Wesley in his doctrine of sanctification or perfection, Christian perfection, that he would call it, talked about being perfect. Now, I will say that John Wesley, later in his life, as he got older, uh, began to question that a little bit. But still, still, uh, we know that uh, Father Wesley or whatever didn't give up on that idea even to the day of his death. He continued to preach Christian perfection even in spite of the evidence that there's a lack thereof in our lives. So what is this all about? Where are we in this? I mean, if, if we have to be perfect to get to heaven, as Jesus said, you know, be perfect. And we're kind of, <laughs> we're kind of missing the mark, wouldn't you think? I don't know. I didn't see anybody here today walk in with halos on. Uh, but I, I, I know that is a scary word. Let's talk about that just a little bit. And, and I thought what we could do today is just kind of go back to the basics. Go back to the basics. And some of these things, if you were going to a walk in Emmaus, like Michelle and some of us have been on, they, they give some of these basic Understandings of what would be a Wesleyan understanding or uh, a biblical understanding of salvation. And they divide it up into several sections. And that is, uh, I'll give you these real quick. Uh, I have added two to this list. But the three that is most talked about is provenient grace, number one. Secondly, justifying grace. And number three, sanctifying grace. And I have added, with provenient grace, convicting grace. And on the end, glorifying grace. So let's talk about that just a minute. What is provenient grace? Well, pre meaning before, uh, grace, pre-grace. The grace that goes before, literally. Before what? What are we talking about? Before what? Well, before we knew anything about God, before we come to the understanding of God, before we come to the knowledge of God, before we said, yes, Lord, I accept you into my life. It's like before we get, you know, when we get married and we say those vows of uh, I, I promise this, it's before that. It's before we even realize it. Before we were born, provenient grace begins to work in our life. That's the grace that goes before. The fact that 
that God is working in and around your life to bring you to Himself even before you realize it. Now some of us can look back and see that. We can see how that God placed certain people in our lives that had they not been there, we may not have come to know God. I think of that myself. My family was, uh, at the time, I was, I, I was sort of, a, you know, not sure what I was looking for, but I was sort of running from God, I guess you might say. And it was at a time when uh, everyone in my family had started going to church, and except for my father and myself at that time. And they were trying to get me to go. And I was like, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm just not ready there. Uh, so I went that summer and stayed with a friend of mine who's, uh, I think, more or less just to get away. And I helped him on the farm. I didn't know at the time that his dad was a, a Pentecostal preacher. <laughs> and I'll tell you, uh, he started in on us and uh, finally... You know, he had a revival and he kept on. And finally, my, my best friend went to that revival and I went with him kind of reluctantly, like John Wesley did at the Aldersgate experience. And he got saved. And God began to work in my life. And so that is the prevenient grace of God working to bring me to him. And then the second one is the convicting grace. Uh, we, we mentioned this before, Paul, is, is, is that that old time conviction that we don't talk much about anymore. You know, we used to say, uh, pray for so-and-so, they're under conviction. Now, if we said that today, a lot of people would know what we're talking about. But basically what we were saying, we would pray for people to get under conviction, by the way, to where I was under conviction in, in the sense that once God began to really speak to my heart and my life, that was the main thing I thought about. I didn't want to go to bed and, and, and I had trouble sleeping because I knew I needed Christ. I knew I wanted to go to heaven. I knew I wanted to be saved. But yet I didn't understand a lot of it. But I was convicted and so I decided in my heart that I was going to go back to church and I was going to give my life to Christ. And that Jesus talks about when the Holy Spirit comes, He will convict the world of sin. That is what it is. It is a conviction or a convincing you that you're sin. You see, until you come to the understanding that you are a sinner, you'll never be saved. Because you won't see the need to be saved. You may say, well, I'm as good as that person, or I'm as good as that person, so I don't need to be saved. But when the Holy Spirit begins to convict you and convince you that you, yes, I am a sinner. And John says if we confess that sin and agree with God, then He will forgive us of our sins. So that conviction is something that's part of the, uh, the salvation picture. And then there's justifying grace. And justifying grace is just that. Is that God declares us righteous. That when we come to Him, He promised He wouldn't turn us away. And that all of the sins and all of the stuff, all of the baggage, we just bring it to Him. And He clears it and wipes the slate clean. And the night that I went into that little Pentecostal church and I bowed and I asked God to come into my heart and change my life, I stood up for that night a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. And it was as if I walked out of the, like the Wizard of Oz when, I, when she stepped out of that house of black and white into a world of color. All of a sudden my perspective was different. Everything seemed different to me. And my world changed. That's justifying grace. Just as if I'd never sinned. God forgives me of my sins and He continues to do so. And then there is the matter of sanctifying grace. We get saved, but that's not all there is to it. There's more to this thing, you see. There's more to salvation than just getting saved. I grew up in, a, in an atmosphere of people that that was their whole focus. Get you saved. And talk about salvation. And every Sunday the preacher preached a salvation message every Sunday. And most of the people were already saved. But it was what it, the focus was. And it's an important focus. But there's more to it. 
Hebrews says, let us go on unto what? Perfection. Oh, there's that word again. Scary word. Uh, so there's where sanctifying grace comes in. And sanctifying grace, uh, I, I happen to believe, maybe a little different than Wesley, but not completely, that it is a process. Please understand that Wesley was not saying, as often misunderstood, that we become free from error or mistakes. That we no longer ever sin, really. He didn't say that we would be super Christians. And that we would just go through life and, and we would be free of disease or problems or anything like that. That was not what the teaching of sanctification was about. What Wesley came to understand, and I think what Jesus is trying to get across, is all the same thing. Is that sanctifying grace is that grace that causes us to fall in love with God. And as our love for God grows greater and greater, and it's a perfect love, by the way, then our love for one another becomes greater. And our desire to please God becomes greater. So what it really boils down to is not a perfect behavior, but a perfect a perfection of intent on the will of God. In other words, we, we can get to the place in this life where our desire is to please God. Our intent. Now we may not always do that in practice, but it's a heart's desire that we please God. Like a child wanting to please their parent, or like an animal wanting to please their master. We want to please God. And sometimes we fail miserably. But that's perfect love. That God knows our heart. And that's called sanctifying grace. And I added one more to that. And that is glorifying grace or glorification. And that is the final icing on the cake. And that we're not there yet. We're not home yet. But there comes a place and a time where we will be perfectly sanctified. And I believe that only happens in glory. When we get a new body, a body without decay, a new body without sin. And that we will truly, truly be perfect in both bodies and soul and spirit. So, as we think about these terms, they're all the same. Well, they all come from the same God, the same Spirit. But it's all about, and the idea of perfection is really about trying to please God. And that's our heart, and that's our desire. Um, so... We begin this process with coming to know God, being convicted of our sin, and then begin to walk in the learning process of, of sanctification. It's a process. It's, it develops over time. And we begin to grow in that. And we're all in different places in that. But it's a desire to wield the will of God in all things. Steve Harper was a teacher at Asbury Seminary, one of my favorites that I had. I took a couple classes and he actually taught on the, floor, on the Florida campus, but I was able to uh, take a, a class with him that was both online and, and got to meet him in person. But Steve Harper, an uh, interesting guy, wrote a book called The Way to Heaven. And in it he describes a parent who measures a child in development and declares that that child is perfect for a four-year-old. In other words, as a four-year-old, that child is doing exactly what we expect from a four-year-old. Sometimes we expect a four-year-old to act like an adult. Now, if we see that same behavior out of an adult that we see in that four-year-old, there's something not quite right there. But in the sense that that child is being a four-year-old, that is perfection. And in our maturity level, that is in the same way that we are acting as we ought to in where we are in life. But we don't stay there. Hebrews says, let us go on to perfection. 
And so the idea is, I'm not there yet. Uh, I haven't been made perfect in love yet. Not yet. But I want to be. I really, really do. And that's, what, that's the way we press on. As we finish up this series, we begin to think about pressing on toward the mark, toward the prize, toward the goal. We press on as we realize that we are all, hopefully, we're trying to reach that same goal and we're striving unto perfection. And we're reaching toward that mark. And we, as Paul said, I haven't apprehended yet. I haven't, I haven't attained it yet. I'm not there yet. I'm, I'm, I'm striving. I'm reaching forth into the things which are before. And I'm forgetting about the things behind. But I know it's attainable. I know it's out there somewhere. And some people may feel that they've attained that in this life. I had a class on the teachings of Wesley and Asbury Theological Seminary. And after the class, when we talked about this very thing, sanctification and perfection, he stopped the class early that day and allowed us to go find our own place to pray about this very thing. And I remember I walked off the campus out of the classroom and found that, you know, outside of the campus was... Uh, was an older cemetery and I went out there and I bowed my knees and I prayed for perfection. I prayed really for sanctification. And I have to say, I didn't get everything I wanted then and there. But I'm, I'm reaching and I'm still working toward that. I'd like to be able to say, I, man, I'm there and you guys just watch what I do, but I can't do that. I'm like you. I'm in a body of flesh, but I'm striving toward that. And, and you know, sometimes I may step backwards two steps and whatever, but I, I'm, I'm reaching. I'm reaching, and out there somewhere is the finish line. Out there somewhere is that place where I will be perfectly made whole, and so are you. So Jesus says, take these two commandments, hang them. And let them be the guide for your life. How many of us do that? With everything that we believe and act upon, if we take these two commandments, to love God completely and to love our neighbor, if we did that, I mean, man, it would make a difference in our world today. But what happens is sometimes we want to be right. We don't care so much about love. We want to be right. In this crazy time of, 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 of an election and everything going on right now with the pandemic, and even the pandemic has been politicized, and we don't care about helping and doing and all. We want to be right. And we want everybody to know that we're on the side that's right, whichever side that is. A fellow one time had a big boulder out in his yard. And he didn't really like the looks of it, so he decided to try to do something about it. And it was too big to move, so he be decided he was going to do something art-worthy of it. And he began to chip away at that, that boulder and decided to make it into a, a shape of an elephant. And when he finally finished it, sure enough, looked like an elephant. And somebody said, how did you do that? And he said, well, I just started chipping away, and I chipped away at everything that didn't look like an elephant. Jesus said, take this picture that I've given you of loving God and loving others and anything that doesn't measure up to that, chip it away. Get rid of it. If being right is what we're concerned about, chip it away. It's not about that. Anything that doesn't measure up. And there was a time in my life, I will tell you, that I was more concerned about theologi being theologically correct and being right and having the right doctrine and doing all the right things and saying all the right things that I wasn't as concerned about loving my neighbor as God told us to do. And God convicted me of that. And God changed me on that. And so I, I, I try to stress that to everyone that it's all about what God has said. All those commandments. You can, you can forget about those 613. You can hang it all up on these two. Love God. And love yourself. When you get up and when you get to, you get ready to say something or do something or post something on Facebook, whatever it is, ask yourself these two things: Am I loving God with this statement, this action, and am I loving my neighbor? John Wesley said it like this: 
do no harm. Is it causing harm? Is it out of love? Or are you just trying to be right when what you do? So, something to think about this morning as we press on toward the mark. Let's ask the musicians to come back up today. And uh, I hope that you will continue to reflect on this, not only here, but as you leave.